Good morning. We want to welcome you here to this meeting of First Southern Baptist Church. It's a joy to see you all here this morning. Uh, when you walked in, we hope that you received a worship guide that looks like this. If you did not, let somebody know and we will get you one. Uh, it has all the information you need to know about this morning's uh, sermon, uh, worship songs, and then other announcements about things that are going on in the life of First Southern Baptist Church. So please check that out uh, and be aware of what is going on. Uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, we're especially glad to have you here with us. Uh, we are praying for you. We pray you are blessed by our time of worship together. Uh, we would love to connect with you in worship, but we would also love to get to know you and connect with you and your family and see what walk of life you're in and see how we might be able to come alongside you and encourage you in that walk. Uh, and the way we do that, uh, in the seat in front of you, underneath you'll find a connection card that looks just like this. If you would take the time to fill out that card, we would greatly appreciate that. This is, again, just a tool that we use uh, to connect with visitors uh, and guests that we have. Uh, some people who are not members that uh, we really would love to connect with you. Uh, if you would take that card and fill that out, we would appreciate that. After the service, you can take that out to the Welcome Center and drop that off. Uh, myself and some other volunteers will be out there. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to answer those questions as well. And on this uh, card as well, for anyone and everyone, there's a place for prayer requests. If you are praying about anything, we would love to join in praying with you. So please write your prayer requests down on that card, and you can drop that off in the tithes and offerings box in the foyer, and we will join in praying with you. So we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, Rick Mays is going to come and read our scripture as we begin our service. Good morning, church. And I didn't trip upstairs. That's a, it's going to be a good day. Uh, my name is Rick Mays. I'm one of the deacons here, and the deacons would like to welcome you to First Southern Baptist. This is your first time. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, we love our pastor, and you're going to enjoy the message today. As deacons, we try to get close to what his sermon is going to be about. That doesn't always happen, but I picked out a couple of uh, scriptures here uh, who Jesus is. Uh, Matthew um, 16, 15 through 16 says, but what, but what about you, he asks. 
Who do you say I am? And Simon answered him and said, You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as only the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we just love you so much, and uh, this time is about you. Uh, it's what you have done for us um, every day. Uh, we are so undeserving of what Christ did on the cross, and we just thank you for the blood that cleanses from our sin. Father, we lift other, our pastor up to you, Lord. Um, we just ask you to be with him as he brings forth your message, and he, I know we'll give you the glory for what you will do. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen. Well, uh, Jason and I tried to talk to Pastor Dave about the dress code for today. Uh, didn't, where did Jason go? So if you, we have the pink thing going. I don't know if you have any pink. Uh, Keith Salee, where's Keith? Uh, get this man some pink. <laughs> well, look, uh, we have so much to be thankful for. We need hope. You're in a world that is starving for hope, and we have it. Things can get better. Uh, they get better individually as we put our hope in Christ because hope in this world uh, runs off, runs away. It, it can't last, but hope in Christ comes back to life. This has been true of the church throughout history. Every, try, every time they try to kill the church, more spring up. You can't do it. And so uh, this first song is just about that. Let's stand together. We'll sing about Death Was Arrested. Without hope, with no place to be in. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. And that was redeemed, only beauty remains. My open heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet. My feet rose again When death was arrested My life began And though your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your
Let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, may that song, the words that we've just sung, be the prayer of our hearts. Lord, we know that you loved that which is unlovely. You picked us up from a world of sin. You brought salvation to our lives. And our lives are new because of what you have done, by what you have accomplished, by your love, you have chosen to love us that which is unlovely. And God, we can only respond with thank you. God, we can only respond with a joy in our hearts. No matter the circumstances of our lives, no matter the trials and tribulations that we go through, Lord, we still say thank you because it is good to know that you have loved us. We come together this morning, Lord, to join our hearts in song, to join our hearts so that we might glean and seek to understand more of what your word has to say to us. Lord, we know that everything done here, our hearts desire that it be to Jesus. And Lord, I pray that this service would honor you. Lord, let each heart here today be a heart that wants to show that to you. Lord, we don't want to just listen. We want to participate. Lord, we just don't want to hear and go through motions. We want lives changed. And Lord, we know that you have the power to change lives. Help us, Lord, as we walk forth from this place in just a little while to recognize you every moment of every day. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand again. This is your opportunity to respond to God for the things that he's done in your life. The curious thing about this world is God often feels absent. It's a struggle that we have if you're honest about your prayer life. Sometimes you get down to pray and you go, God, I don't, I don't even know what to say. Sometimes you go, I don't, I don't know if you're there. I don't know what to do. You can pray that. That's okay. This is your opportunity to sing. Uh, we're going to hear about how his name is special and unique. Uh, so let's sing here. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Oh uh-huh.
song of our hearts could be our prayer and our hope that your name, you who have died and risen again, will give hope to those of us, God, who will one day die, but that we might rise again. Give life to our hearts today, God. Bring life to our spirits as we look to you for all of our hope. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. You can be seated. Turn with me and your copy of God's Word to Hebrews and the first chapter of the book of Hebrews and the first chapter. My interests, I know, are very different than most individuals. Uh, I get on certain websites and I start skimming articles to read and kind of catch up on the things that I'm interested in. Uh, therefore, uh, I love uh, on certain websites they'll have a little caption at the top of the article that is generalizing the article that what subject this falls under. And uh, I skip a lot. I really do. Uh, when it says sports, I just usually skip down to the next one. When it says entertainment, I skip down to the next one. When it says media, I skip down to the next one. As you can probably guess, it takes me about 10 minutes to catch up on everything that I am interested in uh, that's going on in society. I'll watch, I'll read a little bit about uh, some politics that's going on. Uh, I look mostly at science and technology. Now, if that's in the caption, uh, I've got some time to spend here, and I'm going to find out about that. I uh, love the article that I read. This has been a few months back. They found a dinosaur with a feathered bird in its stomach. I don't know if you have recognized that or know the problem with that because they say dinosaurs evolved into birds, but there's a problem when a dinosaur ate a bird. And so that's the kind of stuff that captures my attention. And so I'm kind of delving into those kinds of things. Well, this leaves me in a rather precarious situation when I get around people. Because people are talking about entertainment. They're talking about famous individuals. And I often find myself having to ask the question, who are you talking about? And they'll name a name. And they say, oh, so-and-so. And I'll say, 
Who is that? Now, your pastor looks real stupid a lot of times in a lot of places because I asked the question, who is that? And they're saying, everybody on the planet knows who this is, and you don't? Yeah, well, don't really care. Kind of show you my uh, ignorance <clears throat> and uh, uh, probably whatever respect you had for your pastor is going to be diminished a little bit at least. And uh, I was reading about this couple. I mean, uh, I thought, what is the deal about this couple? I couldn't understand why everybody was so fascinated about this couple. And I uh, heard it on some podcasts. And I thought, maybe, maybe these are really important people, and so I need to look them up and find out who this couple is. And then I read this couple, the husband was the son of the king of England, and he married this actress. And I thought, oh, I've been enlightened. Now I really don't care. Wish I hadn't looked it up. Wish I hadn't wasted the time. But nonetheless, so that's kind of my ignorance about who people are. Now, I know that is a problem in some cases. There are certain people that we should know who they are. We should know some things about them. And I want you to think in regards of this text this morning, because in this text, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ, and we're going to answer the question, who he is from this text. Now, there is a whole lot that could be said about Jesus Christ. So we're going to narrow it down in what is being said in this particular text in Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 2 and 3, which says this. Hath in these days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There are entire books written on just some of the points that I'm going to address this morning. In these two verses speaks of who Jesus Christ is in such a profound and amazing way. As a matter of fact, we understand a lot of things about Jesus from the Old Testament. The Old Testament God Almighty would announce that he was going to send someone <clears throat> who would take on our iniquity, our iniquities and our sins, and that he would take our place in punishment and the wrath of God, and we would go free from the punishment of our sins. We will read in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we read about Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, living a holy and perfect life without any sin whatsoever, calling to himself disciples and training them in the preaching of what it means to be the preaching of the kingdom of God. Then we know that Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died, was dead three entire days, and then was raised again from the dead, thereby purchasing our salvation where he substituted himself for us upon the cross, taking our sins so that we might go free from our sins. When we read the Bible, we learn a lot about Jesus Christ. Now, what is significant about the book of Hebrews is that there are some things <clears throat> that describe Jesus Christ in a way that we would not have this perspective without the book of Hebrews. When we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are referred to as the synoptic Gospels. There we find these different aspects about Jesus Christ. We read the Gospel of John. We kind of see a, a more spiritual aspect of Jesus Christ, but it goes even beyond by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
we see an understanding of who Jesus is by those descriptions, by those pictures that are set forth for us to see and understand. But there are some things in the book of Hebrews that if God had not seen fit for the writer to write these things down, we would not know certain aspects or things about Jesus Christ. That is why this book is so important. From the very first verse of this book until the very last word in the book of Hebrews, it is about Jesus Christ. He is the central theme of this entire book. God says, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand the power that God brought forth in bringing Jesus Christ so that we might know and understand Him. Now, truly, it has to be acknowledged that Jesus Christ is infinite. Just as God the Father is infinite, so is Jesus Christ in who He is. The second person of the Trinity, He is infinite. So let me give you a little heads up. We'll be in heaven about a million years, and we still won't know everything about Jesus Christ. So the little caption that we get here from the book of Hebrews helps us understand something that we would not have known otherwise. So I want you to see some points here in regards to this text this morning. This first point comes from verse 2, and it says, Jesus owns everything. I'm taking that understanding from this phrase that talking about Jesus or his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now, in our country, we have a a different kind of concept of ownership. Uh, We have more of a freedom in ownership in the United States of America than many other countries. There are countries where the government owns everything. They own the businesses, they own the homes, and they own properties and things such as that. In America, though, we're ingrained more in personal property. We, we have possessions. There are things that we grasp and we say, this one is mine. And we sort of have that concept there. Our founding fathers was greatly concerned. If you've studied United States history very much, you'll learn very quickly the founding fathers were greatly concerned about taxes. Now, it wasn't all that much about the individual dollar amounts that was being spent on taxes, but this was the principle that the founding fathers understood. Whatever the government taxes, they can control. As a matter of fact, this is why the Founding Fathers was very much against property taxes because they could see the government seizing people's homes because of back taxes and such as that. Now, we live in a different time than our Founding Fathers, and we're familiar with taxes. As a matter of fact, you can't breathe without paying taxes at some level or way or shape or form. But I want you to think very differently this morning because this statement that Jesus Christ is the heir of all things, heir being one who inherits, one who is going to get all things, it's very, very different than our picture around Christmas time of Jesus Christ and who He is. We know that Jesus Christ came and He was laid in a borrowed manger. Jesus didn't own that manger, nor the barn, or whatever it was that they were inside of. Jesus didn't own that. Joseph did not own that. Mary did not own that. As a matter of fact, in the Scriptures, we read that Jesus never owned a home. He never owned a mode of transportation. If you remember in the Gospels, he had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on. He owned not a horse. He owned not a tool. As a matter of fact, if you remember when they crucified Jesus Christ on the cross, they took his clothing from him, and the soldiers gambled to divide some of it up among themselves. So they even took his clothes. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. He did not own that grave site. Then he rose again three days later. 
But here we see a different picture. We see here where God says, I want this written down, that Jesus Christ is going to be heir of all things. It's all inclusive. There's no limitations. There's no exclusions to this, that it is Jesus Christ who owns it all. Now here is a principle that Christians really need to get a handle on. It is something that we need to be reminded of and that we need to reflect on it often in our lives. You see, we think about our cars or our trucks, automobiles, we think of them as I own them. And many of you would say, well, see here, here's the title. My name is on that particular vehicle. You would think about your home in that regard except many people share it with a bank somehow or another. But nonetheless, uh, we we think of our homes as that which we own, that we, we say this is my possession. You think about your bank account as something that is owned or something that you can have. It was rather disturbing uh, a while back when the truckers were doing the uh, breaking of the truck stuff and all the limitations and things like that and uh, COVID and all those kinds of issues and uh, the country of Canada began to seize the truckers' bank accounts. And we hadn't heard of that kind of thing being done before when, when someone could go into your bank account and say, this is mine, we're taking it, you don't get anything now. That kind of was a disturbing thing to many individuals when we read about such as that. So we think of our bank account counts as something that which is ours. But you know as well as I when I'm referring to what Jesus Christ is spoken of here, we know that all things, all things that you and I are going to give them all up. That Jesus Christ really owns it all. I love to read about heaven. And I know that individuals have different mental images of what heaven is like. In John chapter 14, it speaks to us and says that in my Father's house are, well, the King James says many mansions, but the original Greek describes it as that in God's house there are many rooms. And Jesus Christ says, I'm going to go there to prepare a room for you in heaven heaven. But do you understand this? It's still God's house in heaven. That we're going to be living on God's property. That we're going to have a delightful existence in heaven, but God still owns it all. Here is the preparation that we begin to understand that he really does own it all. This is a discipline that we need to learn as born-again Christians. When we think about that which we have is that which God has entrusted to us. He has given it to us, but yet it is something that is temporary that eventually we do not really own anything. We've been entrusted as stewards of different things that God has given to us. And we can only acknowledge that what I have is that which God has given to me. This is how Jesus Christ would describe this in the Gospels. He said, you got stuff. Some of your stuff's like uh, wood, hay, and stubble that after some duration of time it will all rot, burn up, it won't, it won't be worth anything whatsoever, but you do have some things that is gold, silver, and precious stones. And he says they will endure and they will last. But then we come to the book of Hebrews and read, but those belong to Jesus also because Jesus owns it all. Whatever it is that we seem to want to grasp in our hands and think of our ownership and the things that we have, that is something that is deeply ingrained into our being. But one day, we will give it all to Jesus. Everything that is of value belongs to Jesus. You ever had a thought, an idea, 
I guess I'm just dipping into intellectual property at this point in time. You ever had a thought, an idea, and you thought, that's a really good idea. And I'm going to act upon that idea. Listen, if it really is a good idea, God gave you that idea. Now, I'm, I'm each week typing out my sermons. I do it word for word. I know a lot of preachers don't do it that, and I'm just weird, but I type out my sermons word for word. I don't read them, obviously, but I type them out that way. And I'll be in the middle of, of a thought and have another thought. And I will sit there thinking, oh, that's a good thought. Now, that's my evaluation, maybe not your evaluation, but that's my evaluation on that thought. And I'm thinking, this is a really good thought. And then immediately I have to acknowledge, and I do this. I mean, this is really a part of my thinking process while I'm typing sermons. I stop and say, God, thank you for giving me that thought because it's a good thought. Now, listen, I recognize I have a lot of thoughts that are not good thoughts, and they're junk, and they're failures, and they're, they're I thought they were good at one time, and I find out, oh, that was a, that was a horrible thought. That, I shouldn't even thought that thought. Now, listen, when they're bad, they're all mine. <laughs> they are my thoughts when they're bad. But if it's a good thought, do you understand that that thought belongs to God because He created you? He created your thought processes. He created your mind. Everything that you have as abilities, whether it be intellect, physical, or whatever talent or ability you have, that that is something that God owns and this is acknowledged in verse 2 here because Jesus is heir of all things. We need to acknowledge that in what Jesus Christ says. I love 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul writes and says, I am what I am by the grace of God. We are to acknowledge we are what we are by the grace of God. The second point I want you to see is also found in verse 2 and that is that Jesus made everything. Jesus made everything that was made or what was created. John chapter 1 speaks the very same concept and idea and says everything that was created was created by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who created. Jesus Christ, preexistent from all eternity, is the one who became a babe, and that's when we use the term incarnation. We use the term begotten of God. All of those are similar understandings about Jesus Christ becoming man, yet we know that Jesus Christ is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that Jesus Christ was the creator. This is what verse 2 is alluding to here and pointing out here that everything that was made was made by Jesus. Jesus was not made. Jesus is eternal. There, there, there is that understanding that there, are, there, there is God and he was never created, never made. But everything that was made that we experience was made by Jesus Christ. So we think about the heavens and the earth were made by Jesus. The angels were made by Jesus. Heaven was made by Jesus. Hell was made by Jesus. Now let's stretch your brains a little bit here this morning. Do you understand that Jesus created time? And I know that what's going to be the question in your mind is, okay, what existed before time? I mean, before time, there was something before. <clears throat> we think about time as, as past, present, and future. But past, present, and future didn't even exist until Jesus Christ created time. You think about light. In, the, in chapter 1 of Genesis describes that uh, God created light and he created darkness. Now, I know our mental thought is, well, before creation, everything was dark. No, darkness hadn't been created yet. God even created darkness. Jesus created the light, and he created the darkness, the material universe that we have around us. We can only experience this material universe through our five senses, our, our sight, smell, taste, uh, hearing, and touch. Those are our five senses. We experience the material universe by those five senses, and Jesus Christ created all those. But listen, Jesus Christ also created the spiritual realm. Now, we don't experience that spiritual realm through these five senses, but yet Jesus Christ created them. We can read about them. We can find out what is in that spiritual realm. We can understand those things. But let me step it a bit further, okay? 
Jesus Christ even created those things that we are still discovering today. In the 1950s, uh, uh, Crick and, and Watson, I believe it was, uh, discovered the double helix of the DNA inside of the nucleuses of cells. And they were the first ones who described it and said it's a double helix and all the proteins match together. And they began to make these fantastic discoveries. Have you ever stopped and thought that Jesus Christ created DNA? Isn't that rather amazing? That, that all we can do is discover what God has already done, but Jesus Christ created DNA and all the proteins that go in that. We, we can even go to smaller things, and we can begin to think of molecules, and molecules existing as, as, as uh, protons and, and, and electrons and, and, and neutrons. We, we think about those elements that are inside of a molecule and, and inside of atoms, and we begin to, to think, oh, isn't that amazing? Isn't it, isn't it discovering, finding things like that? Folks, all we're finding out is what Jesus Christ created. And then we can even go to a smaller level than that. We begin to uh, understand some things about physics. And we understand uh, there are quarks that are even smaller than those particular elements. We can think about the, the Higgs boson that was just discovered a few years back. But Jesus created those very things. Now, we're getting tiny in those, but then let's stretch it out and let's think about the vastness of our universe. Our sun is just an average sun of all the stars that we can see through telescopes. But there, there can, our sun is so big that 1.2 million earths can fit inside of our sun. Jesus Christ created that. The light from our sun uh, traverses 93 million miles before it hits earth, somewhere around eight minutes it takes for the sun's light to be able to hit the earth. Light traveling at 186,282 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. That's pretty fast, by the way. It, it, think about the vastness even of our solar system. It takes four hours from light from the sun to reach out to whatever they call Pluto these days. It got demoted as a planet. But whatever Pluto is, uh, it takes four hours for light to be able to get there. We go beyond that and we take a massive picture in our minds to begin to understand the universe. Um, I read a, a lot of papers whenever the, uh, uh, the microwave cosmic background came out. They did this massive astronomy study and uh, they looked in one direction of space, and they looked in the other direction of space as through the Hubble telescope and other, other instruments that they were able to do. And as they can see right now, right now, I mean, it, it, it probably goes on. We just couldn't see it. We got a new telescope up there. We're finding out things further out there. But at this particular time, that uh, the, the universe is 93 billion light years across. I mean, that ought to be astounding to think about Jesus creating all of that. Well, what was so fascinating about the microwave uh, study that was done was that they already know that light from one end of that universe at 93 billion miles away, light years away has already traversed the entire universe and can be seen on the other side of the universe. Now, that should cause some physics problems in someone's brain as they begin to say, wait a minute, every geology textbook, every uh, astronomical textbook, every cosmological textbook I read, the universe is only 15 billion years old. Why aren't they saying it's 93 billion plus? Well, the physics hasn't figured that out yet. It hasn't. They say, no, that, that's wrong. There's some kind of a contradiction there. I love to see scientists fight over such things as that. But here's the point. In the book of Isaiah, the vastness of the universe, it says God holds it in the palm of his hand. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that is being described here in verse 2, that Jesus Christ created all that was created. Point number three, it is found in verse 3. Jesus is the image 
of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, who is the image of the invisible God. This is talking about Jesus Christ. The disciples were arguing one day and frustrated. Jesus had made some uh, very astounding statements that perplexed them, and, and they were uh, confused about trying to understand this. And, and, and Jesus said, we take this by faith. You are to believe this. And, and, and one of the disciples looked at Jesus and said, just show us God. Just show us God, and we will believe. And Jesus Christ answered him and said this, if you've seen me, you've seen God. This is the understanding that Jesus Christ is the image of God. The radiating glory of God is associated with Jesus Christ. Let me teach you a Greek word this morning. Uh, The Greek word here for image in verse 3, the King James puts it, the express image of his person. The word image there is the Greek word icon. Now, icon should sound familiar because there's an English word for icon. We, we understand an icon is an image of something. That's what we call an icon. Well, they just took the Greek word icon, moved it over, and spelled it with English letters and said icon. Now, I'm telling you this because this word image here is the Greek word icon. That Jesus Christ is being declared here in this third verse that you can look at Jesus and see God because Jesus is the icon of God. Now, I know some individuals might say, now, wait a minute, preacher. Uh, Are we not commanded in the Old Testament, do not make graven images? That word is icon. Do not make icons of God. No, we're not supposed to do that. Why? Because God said you will worship this this implement or this thing that you made with your human hands instead of the God who it's supposed to represent. So we're not supposed to have any images of God. We're not supposed to have any images uh, that relate to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the image of God. Now see, here lies the issue that if you believe in the Trinity, all of this is perfectly consistent because Jesus Christ is the icon of God, but he is also understood as the second person of the Trinity. So he is God in human flesh. And so when we read here that Jesus Christ is the express image of God, we are reading that he is the icon of God, but he became flesh and dwelt among us as the verse was read to you by Rick just a moment ago in John chapter 1 verse 14. Because Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, and we worship Him today because He is God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in Him, talking about Jesus, for in Him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. The fourth thing I want you to see this morning is Jesus upholds all things. Verse 3, He is upholding all things by the word of His power. I I mentioned a couple of Sundays ago about deism, that some believe that God created everything and then just stepped back and it just sort of runs on its own. This verse is directly contradicting that idea, that God doesn't interact with his world and all that, because here it is stating clearly that if Jesus ceased to do, if Jesus ceased to be, if Jesus ceased upholding all things, then all things would cease to exist. I want to introduce you this morning to a, uh, it's uh, sometimes referred to as a a principle. It's called the anthropic principle. Uh, It comes from a Greek word, anthropos. You see several different words uh, uh, in regards to anthropos. Anthropos is the Greek word for man, meaning mankind. Ander is the uh, man being an individual human being. But, But when it talks about anthropos, it's talking about humanity, human beings. And so anthropos is used in the sense of the anthropic principle is a description that things exist the way they do so that we can exist upon this earth. 
And there is such a precision to all of these things that, that I know they continue to try to say, well, it happened because of evolution this way. And, and, and they keep running into roadblocks and confusions and, and things of why it is so specific. Why is it so narrow in its precision to be able to work so that you and I would even exist here upon this earth? The very temperature of your body has to be regulated. We know that if we have a temperature that goes just a few degrees too high, it begins to do damage to the body. If your temperature just goes down a few degrees, it starts doing damage to your body. We know that. There's just that, that little kind of, what well, they call it, Goldilocks zone, where, where things work because of that perfect balance that is there. It is a closely measured system. Your blood operates in a very close measured system. The very cells of your body work in a very closely measured system. It goes from the molecular level even to the cosmic level. You know our sun burns, if you've studied any of this, it it burns about 12,000 degrees. If it was a little bit hotter, earth would burn up. If it was a little bit colder, earth would freeze. If we were a little bit closer to the sun, we would burn up. If earth was a little bit farther from the sun, it would freeze and no life would be able to exist here. We think about the tilt of the earth. I don't know if you've ever studied this. We have seasons. Now, whatever your feeling is about uh, winter may fit into this a little bit, all right? The earth tilts. It's not straight up and down as it goes around the sun. It tilts at 23 and a half degrees. That's why we have seasons. You know, when the tilt is closer to the sun, there's summer in the southern hemisphere, and whenever it's closer to the sun in the northern hemisphere, it's summertime for us. And that is a specific thing, because if the earth was straight up and down, the, the planet would burn around the equator, and everything on the poles would be frozen, and we'd be like Mars, okay? It's just, it's just, it's just a fine-tuned thing that has to work in a very specific way in all of those kinds of things. Do you understand the moon was even closer to the earth? Uh, even astrophysicists have fun trying to understand why whenever there's a, uh, a solar eclipse, when the moon goes in front of the, the sun, it, it's almost a perfect measurement of the sun to that disk that you can visibly see. It's a unique thing, and, and everybody wonder why it works that way. Do you understand if the moon was any closer, the oceans would literally inundate the land masses and would flood everything up on the earth? I'm just kind of hitting some different things to help you understand how precise, and there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of these precisions that have to be exactly right. Even the depth of the ocean is, has to be within a certain range because if it was any deeper, then the carbon, by not, carbon dioxide and the oxygen would uh, not mix, and we wouldn't have air to be able to breathe in the right consistency. Even the density of our atmosphere, I don't know if you understand how serious this is, the density of our atmosphere has to be at a certain precise level. Uh, have you ever been standing out at night watching the stars at night? I love doing this. It's better in the wintertime, by the way, but you look up in the sky uh, around my birthday, uh, August 13th. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the meteor showers that begins to, the, to go through the, the, the sky. And you can stand out there and see all these little streaks of light going across. That happens every day and every hour of earth. You just can't see it at certain times. And if the density of our atmosphere was any thinner, we'd be getting shot with rocks moving at the speed of bullets. And it hit the ground and killed everything above the ground. Because our atmosphere is at a certain density, those things hit the atmosphere and they burn up, and we see them as shooting stars. There is such a precision. This is a massive study that is just exciting to look at, and I bring just a tidbit of it to you this morning so that you might read these words and say, wow, Jesus, everything is being upheld by your word. Jesus is doing that of every moment of every day And there is that delicate balance that Jesus says, he exists, therefore we know these things are happening. Number five, and lastly, Jesus sat down. I know that's not really a point that you go, wow, 
you're not really excited about, Jesus sat down. Uh, you know, uh, I know a lot of times when we think about setting down, we do it unconsciously. It's just nothing that really kind of uh, really hits us. But I want you to understand from the context of what Hebrews is describing here. Um, I'm having a blast reading through uh, Exodus, Leviticus. I'm, I'm starting Numbers right now. And I know everybody just says, oh, wow, I just don't get up in the morning wanting to read the book of Numbers. Um, uh, if you've read Levit Leviticus, if you've read all the intricacies of God creating or having Moses make all these things for the tabernacle, and there's all these details of how long these curtains should be, how many rings should be on the curtains, what should be covered with gold, what should be covered with dolphin skin or some kind of an animal skin, and all these detailed instructions, God set all that forth about the tabernacle. And then he moves to the holy place and says, there are certain furniture I want there. I want this candelabra, the seven-stick uh, candelabra, and I want this table here, and, and, and all these different implements. And then you go into the Holy of Holies, and the furniture that is there is just the Ark of the Covenant. There's nothing else. But inside the temple, where all the priests and the Levites worked, there was never to be a chair. There is no description in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy even, the second giving of the law. We, we, we read all that, we see all these details, and there's never a description of a chair. It's because when the priests go in there and they begin to do sacrifices, and they are to perform the sacrifice for the people. They would sacrifice a ram, a lamb, an oxen. It might be a turtle dove for those who are very poor. And when they were done, they began to prepare for the next day because they had to do it again. It wasn't just a day-to-day -day responsibility. It was a month-to-month, -month, a week-to-week, -week, a year-to-year it was not just an individual's lifetime that this was something set up that God said, I want you to do this generation after generation after generation, and it is to be done until the promise comes. And Jesus Christ is that promise. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross and died, He was the perfect sacrifice and the Bible makes it very explicit. It not only mentions it in Hebrews, there's other places in the New Testament, that when Jesus Christ had accomplished what He accomplished on the cross, He rose again from the dead, and then 40 days later ascended into heaven. And if you ask me, preacher, what did Jesus do the first moment He stepped back into heaven? And the answer would be this. He sat down. Because the job was finished. Nothing else had to be done. It was completed. It grieves my heart as I watch individuals who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That He came and He died on the cross so that we might put our faith and trust in Him. And we don't add to anything that Jesus has done because it is finished. He sat down. It was accomplished. Nothing needed to be added. But yet I read over and over again when I hear Christian denominations or other peoples of other faiths and other belief systems, and they began to talk about, well, I had to add to what Jesus has done. I hear individuals, oh, I had to go get baptized or I wouldn't have been saved. Then that's adding to what Jesus has already accomplished. I, I hear, oh, I have to be a good person or I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to lose my salvation. Do you understand we are to be good in obedience to Jesus Christ, but you cannot add to your salvation. And by the way, Jesus Christ holds your salvation. No one can take it away from you. That's because he finished it and he sat down on the cross. I, re I, I read about, uh, I, I've got these books in my office and a particular religious group uh, was, was uh, uh, advertised charging people to give them vast amounts of money so that they can get sins forgiven. And they were doing this for other people too. I want to I pay this gob of money so that somebody else would get saved and have their sins forgiven. 
And Martin Luther had something to say about indulgences, and, and that really led to a reformation. Yet it is still going on today where people are trying to add to what Jesus Christ has already accomplished. So, when you read that Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father, I hope it brings a world of understanding to you to know and to understand that Jesus has accomplished all for your salvation. You cannot add to it. So, what do you need to do? You need to believe in what Jesus Christ has accomplished. You need to believe in what He has said is done, that it is finished. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Might it be that this morning there might be someone saying, you know, I need to know what it means to become a Christian today. I, I hear what you're saying, preacher, but I, I want to know what the Bible says more than what you just said. And there is a lot there, but we'd love to sit down and just point to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We'd love to talk to you about that, but you need to let us know in regards to that. We provide an opportunity here. We call it an invitation. We're just inviting people that if the Lord leads you in some way to come, and we would love to talk to you about Jesus. Now, there's other things that we encourage individuals to do during this invitation time. There are those who have maybe very serious things that you want to pray about. And maybe today you want to come and just maybe kneel here if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, you can just stand here at the altar and pray. Our deacons love to pray with individuals. You don't need to say anything. If you just mind just holding your hand up by your shoulder, our deacons would see that and they'd just come and just pray with you. That's all. We wouldn't embarrass you in any way. I also know that there are other things that people would like to do. I know that this morning uh, one has... Uh, communicated that they would like to join this church and be a member of First Southern Baptist Church. So I'm going to present that in just a moment. Maybe someone else is being led to place their membership here at First Southern. There's many, many other things that God may be moving in your heart, whatever it is.